Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. Say love you. <laughs> Thank you, Mom, for everything you've done for me. I love you, Mommy. I love you. <laughs> what I like about my mom is that she always supports us in whatever we're doing. Uh, I love Mommy because I just love her so much and I suffer too. Hey, Mom. Thanks for everything you do. Happy Mother's Day. Love you. What I like about my mom is that she's always doing stuff to make us smile. Whether it's watching movies with us, or going on hikes with us, or buying us puzzles, or even just making sure we have all the snacks we want. What's up, Mom? Happy Mother's Day. I love you. I love you, Mommy. What I like about my mom is how much motivation she offers me even in the times where I personally want to give up, but she knows it's best for me. What I like about my mom is that she's always thinking of us before she thinks of herself. Oh uh -huh.
One of the things that's true about the pandemic is there's a lot of fear. I'm standing outside of Canterbury Skilled Nursing Facility where at last count there were 49 deaths. And I try to imagine what it would be like to be a resident there or a family member of a resident or a worker. I've got to imagine that there would be an enormous amount of fear. And by the way, some of our families of young children provided some baked goods for the workers there, which was really a lovely gesture. But these retirement and skilled nursing facilities have become a type of emblem of the fear that is rampant during COVID-19. I'm also wearing this mask. Governor Northam said uh, that phase one of opening up is gonna happen this week. And I found myself wondering what it's gonna be like for all of us to be together again. One thing that nobody has named is, I think we've learned to fear each other. We're wearing these masks and these masks are an emblem of our fear. As I understand it, this mask is to keep me from infecting you. So when you see me with a mask, it helps to alleviate your fear that I might, affect, uh, I might infect you with the virus. And when I see you with a mask, that alleviates my fear that you might infect me with the virus. So we're opening up on Friday, but the fact is COVID-19 is still out there. The virus hadn't gone away. And the question is, what will we do with our fears? What are we gonna do with our fears about economic recession? What do we do about our fears about food shortages and job insecurity? What will we do about our fears that we might get sick or even die? What are we gonna do with our fear that's the topic for our message today. We're in a series, Who is God? And we're asking the question, what if the pandemic is an opportunity to learn more about who God is? I think our series graphic is helpful because it shows how COVID-19 has caused the world to appear out of joint. The world just doesn't fit together anymore like it once did. It just doesn't look the same. And I think for many people, God seems out of joint. People are dying and out of work in record numbers. And so people are asking, who is God and where is God? COVID-19 has turned the world on its head. But what if God is trying to show himself during the pandemic? That's the question at the heart of this series. We're looking at the experiences of God's people in the book of Exodus. The entire narrative of Exodus plays out in a desert wilderness, in an environment of death, and deprivation and loss, much like the environment that we're in today. And we're learning that Exodus is a book that reveals who God is. It's a book whose main character is God. So today we're going to look at how God helps us learn to deal with our fears in the wilderness. Now it goes without saying that fear uh, rules most of our lives. Fear is a powerful, debilitating force in every life. We fear what our children will do. We fear the consequences of our interaction with someone at work. We fear what's happening in our bodies because of age or disease. We fear not getting married. We fear not having enough money. We fear being out of control. On a deeper level, we fear failure, rejection, and abandonment. This is why it's important for us to learn how God helps us learn to deal with our fears in the wilderness. Today, we're gonna to read a section of Exodus where the Israelites are learning how to deal with fear. It's the parting of the Red Sea. It's a familiar text to many of you, and we'll find it in Exodus chapter 14, verses five to 22, and I'll walk you through the text. We're on the edge of the Sinai Desert, 
Moses and the Israelites have been released from being slave brickmakers in Egypt. The date is around 12 to 1500 BC. I'll begin with chapter 14 at verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have I done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and put his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near pi Haharoth and opposite baal Zephon. The Israelites had left Egypt with Pharaoh's permission, but then Pharaoh changed his mind and came after them. The feeling that Moses, the author, wants to give us is that of immensity, scale. Pharaoh was a powerful man with an enormous army. The chariot was the most lethal instrument in, for war in the ancient world. And Pharaoh brought 600 of his finest chariots along with many more. By contrast, what weapons did the Israelites have? We learned last week they had short swords. They were untrained soldiers. The point was Israel didn't stand a chance. Verse 10, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. And I want you to imagine this moment. The Israelites are going about their day, washing clothes, gathering food, and tending camp. When somebody looks up, and as far as the eye can see, in every direction, there are legions of Egyptian soldiers and chariots. This is like one of those climactic scenes in The Lord of the Rings. Well, not surprisingly, verse 10 says, they were terrified and they cried out to the Lord. The most disabling form of fear is terror. Your body goes limp, your face goes white as a sheet. I imagine some people feel terror when they first test positive for COVID-19 or when they first learn that they've recently been in contact with someone who tested positive. The Israelites were terrified and they cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, and I listen to the irrational thinking here, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Is that what they said to Moses? If you go back to Exodus chapter 4, verse 31, it says that when Moses told the Israelites God would be freeing them, they fell down and worshipped him. The point is that fear uh, disables our thinking. We can't think straight when we're afraid. The Israelites were terrified and they couldn't think straight. But their fear uh, is the very setting in which they're going to learn who God is. Verse 13, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. The grammar is in the imperative here, and so you can picture Moses saying, stop fearing. And I find this clarity helpful. Whenever I'm afraid, I'm tempted to go on fearing because I think to myself, well, maybe I should be afraid. Maybe it's the responsible thing to do to be afraid, given the situation I'm in. I find it helpful when Scripture gives us definitive action. Flee to sexual temptation. Run. Stop fearing. Fear is never warranted. So Moses answered the people, stop fearing. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, will never, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Verse 14 is the heart of the passage. The Lord will fight for you amidst your fears. 
What does this mean? Well, the backdrop here is God's covenant promises to his people. Back in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Well, these words were the prelude to God's covenant with Israel through Abram, who would later be named Abraham. What God promised Abram was descendants and a land to call their own. God pledged himself in love unilaterally to his people. He said, I will be your God and you will be my people. It was deep assurance to God's people. And his pledge included protection and provision. Now, when we come to Israel's desert journey and this moment in the journey, Moses uh, recalls that covenant. And he is able to say, the Lord will fight for you amidst your fears. The point was, you have a Savior now. Remember, the reason the Israelites were in the desert was, surprisingly, because God led them there. But they weren't there to be abandoned. They were there to learn who the Savior is. They were there to learn of the love of God and the provision and protection of God in the wilderness. They were there to learn the Lord will fight for you. He will take up your cause. He will come to your aid. That's what's being revealed to them in the desert. Now, I think God is overturning the curse of the Garden of Eden because Satan's lie in the garden to Adam and Eve was, God doesn't care about you, therefore you have to go it alone. It's an orphan mentality. It's the mentality that I'm all alone, therefore I have to go it alone. And it's the lie that has resided in the human heart ever since. But Moses is saying to his people, uh, you're not alone. You have an advocate now. Even as we look ahead, you have a heavenly father now. The Lord will fight for you. He's faithful to you. He's faithful to his covenant promises. So what's unexpected is our part. It's what comes next. He says to the people, you need only to be still. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. I think what's happening here is, uh, I think there are two ways that we can think of being still spiritually. One way is we grow still when we want to spiritually take uh, like a walk in the woods or be alone uh, with our Bible somewhere. But this kind of being still, I think, comes when the Israelites are bumping up against their incapacity. Remember, the Egyptians are bearing down on them and Israel is altogether overmatched militarily. And so what's happening here uh, maybe makes more sense when we understand that the Lord is saying, or Moses is saying, be still because there's nothing you can do anyway. (laughs) But that's an emblem for God's grace. So I don't want you to miss God's grace in the Old Testament. What is God's part in this salvation rescue plan? It's all of it. What is the Israelites' part in the salvation plan? It's none of it. <laughs> One of the privilege, therefore, of privileges of being a Christian is the invitation to be still. And I think there's something that we really can learn from this. And I wonder if one of the things that COVID-19 is doing for us is forcing us as a nation and as a world to be still. We're doing everything we can. We're we're activist people in the West. Uh, We busy ourselves. We solve our problems ourselves. And in this case, the federal government is doling out money at record levels and research labs across the globe are working around the clock to create a vaccine. But will it be enough? I think we're all wondering that. And God could be inviting all of us, the nations of the earth, to bump up against our incapacity so that we might be drawn to rely on his capacity. Psalm 46 
10 says, be still and know that I am God. Which makes me ask the question, what if it's true that we have to be still before we can know who God is? We have to stop acting as if it's all up to us in order to start admitting that so much of it is up to God. We have to stop, we have to be convinced that we're not God before we can start to explore who God is. So I think there's an invitation to us as a people and as a nation. Even in COVID-19, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. So let's go on. Verse 15, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. So when we come to the end of ourselves and transfer our trust from ourselves to God, who gets the glory? Well, God gets the glory. That's one of the things that's happening here. So verse 21, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, And all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. So Moses raises up his staff, and the waters of the Red Sea part. It's the same staff that Moses uses to strike the rock when he gets water out of the rock. Now, scholar Doug Stewart makes the point that the Hebrew word for wall here connotes not a small stone or retaining wall, but always a massively large wall like a city wall. Stewart goes on to say, it's clear from the description that the sea through which the Israelites walked was deep deep water, not something shallow. The water piled up like walls on the left and on the right. I think God wanted his people to experience a miracle at his rescue so they could internalize his love and care. And why didn't the Israelites get crushed by the Egyptians? Well, the answer is they had a mediator. Moses raised the staff to divide the Red Sea. He was Israel's mediator. But there's another mediator, a better mediator, Jesus Christ. Jesus would be raised up on a staff and a crossbeam. He is our mediator, the one who saves us from sin and death. So Israel's crossing the Red Sea is a great picture of salvation. The minute they crossed over the sea, they crossed over from death to life. This reminds me of the words of Jesus about eternal life from John 4, verse 5, verse 24. Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. So here's uh, an important invitation in today's text that I don't want you to miss. Would you like to cross over from death to life? Now, Christianity is often misunderstood uh, as a religion of virtue, as a religion where God is urging people to be better. But I think we get clearly uh, the picture, even here in the Old Testament, of God's grace. Salvation was a free gift. The Israelites did nothing to earn it. And now, in light of Jesus having come to the earth and died and raised on our behalf, we too realize that to uh, receive the gift of life uh, is a free gift. It's a gift of God's grace. And we receive that life crossing over from death to life 
by receiving Jesus by faith. And so let me just, if you've discovered something about God and His grace, and you are being prompted to say, I want to receive that God, then the way to do that is to receive His Son by faith. And I hope you'll do that today. Well, there's one more thing I want you to see about how God helps us to learn to deal with our fears in the wilderness. In Psalm 77, 19, the psalmist interprets the crossing of the Red Sea. He writes, Your road led through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters. And here's the point I want you to see. A pathway no one knew was there. Now, when the Israelites were standing there on the water's edge, trapped with the Egyptians bearing down on them, I've got to believe that none of them knew that there was going to be a parting of the Red Sea. They would have been terrified because from their perspective, there was no way out. But what I don't want you to miss is God provided a way out. He made a way out where there appeared to be no way out. He made a path unseen. The point is God is a way maker. And he is a way maker for us. So here's an important final application from today's text. The Lord will fight for you in ways you can't yet see. I think this is so exciting if you get this. Because again, I found myself wondering what the Israelites were thinking when Moses said, be still, uh, be still and then what? Well, Moses would have said, well, trust God. Well, they would have said, trust God for what? And Moses would say, I don't know yet. Just trust God, trust in his character, trust in his love and faithfulness, trust that he will come to your aid. And there's so many situations for me where uh, what fuels my fear is that I look at what I'm dealing with and I say to myself, I don't know how we're going to get out of that one. Lisa and I are in a situation right now with our daughter Galena, uh, who is married and has a young son and lives in San Diego. And Galena came to us when she was 15 and we adopted her. And she is still trying to get her citizenship. And she's had a green card now for five years and should be able to get her citizenship. But we recently learned there's a problem with that. And the problem goes back to uh, a process issue that happened um, when Galena was living with us. And we were being guided by an attorney, but we were, she was also under our stewardship and guidance. And so we feel complicit in the problem with the green card. Uh, it, was, it wasn't something we did knowingly, but it was, it's now something that we've ended up with. And so Galena has uh, suffered um, having to think about it and having to figure out how to solve it, and so have we. And that's a situation where I look at it and I go, there are things I fear here. Uh, and I really can't see how this is going to work out. We've consulted attorneys. But it's a situation when I apply what I'm learning here where I can say, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust in his character. I'm going to trust that the Lord is fighting for me and for Galena especially in ways that we can't yet see. And I know that's the same for you. Maybe right now you're in a difficult situation with a child or a coworker or a friend, or maybe you're in a health scare, or maybe you're living in the world like we all are, and we're all part of something where it's easy to wonder where God is and will there be a way out. Friends, uh, perfect love casts out fear. The pure and perfect exp expression of God's love would be his own son. And Jesus himself would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He would become our guarantee that the Lord is fighting for us in ways that we can and we can't yet see. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father, we bow in humility and hope. 
during this pandemic, acknowledging that you are God and we are not. And we turn to you in the midst of our fears and we trust you. We trust that you are fighting for us, that you uh, have and will come to our aid, that you are the Lord who is fighting for us amidst our fears in ways that we can't yet see. So we trust you and we pray to you with gratitude and it's in Christ's name, amen. Well, hi, this is Steve Boyce. I'm Nicole Boyce. And we are having another little video about uh, financial stewardship. And we thought we'd share a little bit about how we began our journey with tithes and offerings when we first got married way back in 1984. Four. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. And um, do you remember, Nicole, I think where we first got our instruction and learned about tithes and offerings was really part of a, our um, walk together with Christ back at... Was it was it? at Knox Presbyterian Church. In? In Silver Spring, Maryland. Yeah. It was a very Bible-based church. Yeah, and, and they they taught us a lot about all sorts of things with regard to our faith in Christ and uh, in the Bible. And when it came to tithes and offerings, the, the main... I remember learning, for example, that Jesus talked about money as much as any other subject in the Bible. Do you remember? I do. I think there was one verse that spoke to you especially. Yeah, there was. And um, that was um, Malachi chapter 3. It's the last book of the Old Testament. And I'm going to read, um, read that to you all. This is Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 7. And it says, Ever, time, ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are you robbing me? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and, there, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven 
and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. And I think what caught my attention about that verse is it was also taught to us, and this is proven to be true. I've studied the Bible for a long time since then. And apparently this is the only place in the Bible where God says, test me in this. He actually invites us to test him, to trust him, that if we bring in our tithes and our offerings as we're supposed to, he says, see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and give you everything you need, basically. That was the, that's the part, give you what you need, or just take care of you, is how we read that. Right, so it was all about trust. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, for us, it was a scary thing. Nicole was raised in a church, that, you know, military church, and the government funded it, so there wasn't any financial teaching for you guys about tithes and offerings because the church was supported by the right. military. And I didn't really grow up in a church, uh, per se, that learned that. So it was all new and kind of scary to us. And, and that just challenged me, the thought that God said, test me in this. And we have certainly found, I think you would agree, that uh, as we have tested God in that, that he has certainly proven himself to be faithful to us. He has. Yeah, I can think of a million examples. So...
feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, and even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working. Happy Mother's Day, everybody, to all the mothers and spiritual mothers, and receive the benediction. And I'll invite you to extend your hands to receive as I raise my hands to offer the benediction to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you His peace. Amen.